Hi, Marco. Hello. Hello. Everyone's hopping on. All right. I'm going to hop off for a minute. I have to let people in. Terry. Hello, Matteo. I'm going to unknock everybody here at the beginning. Give folks a few minutes to get on. There are birds chirping somewhere. <clears throat> There's this schizophrenic kind of experience sometimes when we're on the Zoom of, in one ear I hear birds chirping in some kind of countryside and in the other I hear uh, sirens blaring in some kind of city. We do our mic checks uh, while we give uh, other potential participants a chance to get on. Testing. Can you hear me? Yep. Testing. Can you hear? Sounds good. Okay. Hello. Greetings. Is that Mateo? Mm hmm. Hello. This is Terry. Hi, Terry. Hi, Terry. Hello. And Kim, are you there? She sometimes gets on and then covers up her camera while she does other things surreptitiously and then joins us. Jeffrey, I think I heard you. Yeah. Okay. So, Kim, uh, check in when you can, if you hear this. I'm, I'm here. Hi, Doug. Hello. Give it one more minute, and then we could officially get started. Hello, Flo. Hello, Flo. Hello. Hi. Kim's there. Kim's there, but we have Aha. Yeah. Good. I'm almost there. Hold on. All right, I'm going to mute you all and do some house housekeeping and then turn it over to Don to lead the session, uh, including the meditation uh, part. 
Uh, so this is our fourth session now of the Journey to Supermind reading group uh, or study group or practice group or some synthesis of all, all of those things and perhaps something beyond that as well. And uh, it's being hosted by Metapsychosis Journal, uh, which I'm have been reminded recently, here's Lauren, uh, has now been in existence for just coming on two years. So we launched the website uh, two years ago, and um, it's been a really interesting experiment uh, because we've done a number of reading groups uh, focusing on uh, not just different philosophers, but also uh, authors, uh, f fiction authors, um, other conversations on topics in cosmology, consciousness studies, literature, the arts, uh, science, uh, and a sort of um, maybe even a kind of limbo zone or liminal or, or kind of weird studies. Uh, one, uh, one of the participants on the forum, uh, J.F. Martel, has a podcast uh, called weirdstudies.com, uh, weird studies, uh, which is at weirdstudies.com. And so we're really, I think, exploring um, different spaces uh, in culture and consciousness. And I have envisioned this site as a kind of convergence point or a node where uh, a curious mix, a different kind of mix of energies, of ideas, and of potentialities uh, could be incubated, could converge and turn into something, change into something, transform, transmute. Uh, we've played with a lot of different language around what the process is because, uh, in effect, I think we're creating a, a field. Uh, and, uh, and so there, there's a trans-individual uh, dimension <clears throat> where we're bringing our unique, weird, different uh, perspectives. Uh, but also, seeking, I think, to go beyond them, to enter into uh, other things of thought, other um, potentially ways of being. And uh, so, as a reminder, this is being recorded and we're sharing it on our website at metapsychosis.com, as well as our discussion forum, which is at infiniteconversations.com. Uh, uh, and uh, we're... we're, we're Engaging in this as a kind of, I'm going to use some technical words, but they've come up and they didn't come from me. They they're just have emerged as part of our, our dialogues, uh, a multimodal and a polyphasic. So those are two kind of technical words, um, a multimodal and a polyphasic experience. Multimodal in the sense that here we are in, let's say, real time uh, or virtually real time together at the same time, even though we're distributed in, in space and time, but there's an event happening now. But at the same time, we have this textual component and this asynchronous uh, component, which is on the forum and where thoughts have a chance to play in a different way or in a different tempo uh, than they do in a concentrated space here. And so there's been uh, a fairly lengthy discussion uh, following from the conversation last week, and that's on the forum at Infinite Conversations. Uh, and it's a space where anyone uh, who signs up, it's free to sign up, there's no charge, can uh, join and participate, add their thoughts, re respond, or just read and contemplate what's arising, what's being said, and use it as, as a learning experience. And so that's how I'm seeing these recordings is that they can be aids to, to future learning uh, for ourselves to the, to, you know, insofar as we might want to go back and revisit uh, something that was said or an exchange or an idea uh, and develop it further, um, go with it in some other direction, or for others who might be coming to this at a different time. And uh, so, as I said, this is offered in, in the spirit of a gift, as, as a, a, a gesture in a gift economy that uh, uh, we're attempting to invoke and evoke. Uh, we do have a, a a website or a, a page at opencollective.com where anyone can support uh, our projects uh, with a monthly or one-time donation. So that's at opencollective slash metapsychosis. 
and uh, encourage, invite you to, uh, to support what we're doing. And um, I'd like to, I mean, I'd like to say that the idea of metapsychosis, now that we're reading Aurobindo, I'm getting these different reflections on what that even means, because it just came to me. And then I got excited about it. And I imagined it as this, this project uh, that, that we've, that we've undertaken. But the philosophical and maybe the poetic idea is to go beyond or to gain a perspective beyond what I would con- perhaps in a s- somewhat uh, joking way, but also in a serious way, consider to be the psychosis of everyday life, uh, the psychosis of egoic, let's say, reality. Uh, and what, what perspectives can we gain on that or even through that? Uh, because there's this interesting interplay between the individual, the universal, the particular, the cosmic. And this comes through so beautifully, I think, in Aurobindo's writings. And I think that's why it's such a perfect book for us to be reading, um, whatever becomes of it and wherever we go with it. So um, this is, as I said, our fourth session, and we're going to be continuing uh, through, uh, I believe, the middle of November. Uh, We have a schedule of reading, and for this session, we... Uh, the chapters 12 to 16 were on the schedule. But I also realized that people are coming into this at different points, um, they're reading at their own tempos and experiencing the text in different ways. So uh, I want to kind of regard that, that schedule or that, that, temp, that pace as kind of a, sort of just one uh, possible uh, timeline that one could follow to set the pace. And so I'm going to follow it to set the pace, but wherever anyone is, they could really drop in in this sort of quantum way uh, at any point. And I think that if we bring freshness and newness to each uh, event, then really there could be multiple lines going. And some might really, some might follow along with the pace. Uh, some might uh, be very intense, but for a, a a brief moment of time or for one aspect of the text, uh, some might go slower and uh, maybe go off in some other direction or circle back around. There are multiple ways, in other words, uh, I think perhaps in the spirit of integral yoga to uh, experience uh, and to co-experience, to experience this text together. So all that said, I'll turn it over to Don to lead us into uh, the conversation and the practice uh, with um, with the life divine. Thank you, Marco. This will take about five minutes. I'll just say a quick word about a text I'm going to read. My sense from last week's session, from talking to you guys in a very delightful exchange online, is that there's a real pull for the philosophy, but my sense is that the really deep passion is for both the individual and social collective transformation that's implicit in Trier Mendel's writings. So this is a letter that he wrote to a disciple in 1927, it's considered among the sadhaks of the integral yoga in one of the Bibles of the, of the um, tradition. And because we've been reading chapters on the supermind, this really is about the most practical relationship the soul can have with the force, the living force, the conscious force of the supermind. Um, it's much simpler language than life divine, but there's going to be a lot of language that's unfamiliar. So if it doesn't sound too cultish, cultish, I'd invite you to to consider that Sri Aurobindo's words for many have a mantric quality. So just listen to them as you meditate. Let the mantric quality of the rhythm just, you know, absorb you in a flow. If you want to be a true doer of divine works, your first aim must be to totally, be totally free from desire and self-regarding ego. 
All your life must be an offering and a sacrifice to the Supreme. Your only object in action shall be to become a manifesting instrument of the divine Shakti in her words. A time will come when you are more and more the instrument and not the worker. Your contact with the Divine Mother will become so intimate that at times you will have only to concentrate and put everything in her hands to have her present guidance, the sure indication of the thing to be done and the way to do it and the result. Afterwards, you will realize the Divine Shakti not only inspires and guides, but initiates and carries out your works. <clears throat> While this transformation is being done, there must be no attachment to the work or the results, no laying down of conditions, no claim to possess the power that should possess you. Let your faith, your sincerity, and the purity of your aspiration be absolute. Then every disturbing element and distorting influence will progressively fall away from your nature. The last stage of this perfection will come when you are completely identified with the Divine Mother and feel yourself no longer to be another and separate being, but truly a child and eternal portion of her consciousness and force. Always she will be in you and you in her. It will be your constant, simple, and natural experience that all your thought, all your seeing and action, your every breath and movement come from her and are hers. You will know and see and feel you are a person and power formed out of herself, put out from her for the play of manifestation and yet always safe in her, being of her being, consciousness of her consciousness, force of her force, ananda of her ananda. When this condition is entire and her supramental energies can freely move you, then you will be perfect in divine works, knowledge, and will. Your action will become sure, simple, luminous, spontaneous, flawless, an outflow from the supreme, a divine movement of the eternal.
So, I'd like to start with a note of gratitude. Um, Jan and I both felt very grateful and very delighted to take part last week. And let's see if I've got this right. I think I've been conversing with, I'll look across the screen, Marco, Jeffrey, Johnny, Mateo, Abet, Doug, and I think Ed, who wasn't here, and Derwin. And um, the light, it, it's a very different experience to see all you again here in person. It's very nice. So, as Marco just said, we seem to be on different chapters. And I looked, so I looked through 12 to 21 to kind of, I've, I've had some different um, interpretations, a couple of different books, and I was looking through, I spent the last hour, I was going to read some passages, I thought this is too complicated. So, um, in light of what I said before the meditation, that there seems to be, the, 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 the passion seems to be in the individual and social collective transformation, um, not separate from the philosophy, but related to it. Um, here's what struck me as I was going through the book. There's a phrase, I love this phrase, toward the end of book one, part two, where Sri Aurobindo tells you the cause of all, all the problems in the universe. And he uses the phrase exclusive concentration. And I think quite a few of you know Ian McGilchrist's book, The Master and the Emissary, where he talks about we have these two different kinds of, actually, he uses the term left brain, right brain, but it's really neural networks that, that don't fit the old pop idea of left brain, right brain. So one kind of attention is selective attention, which sees the details, sees the parts, at the extreme loses the sense of the whole. Um, it tends to foster a much stronger sense of a separate self. And this is very, very similar to what Sri Aurobindo describes as exclusive concentration. And the other that McGilchrist describes is um, this broad, intuitive, metaphorical, um, bodily connected, emotionally connected, imaginative um, attention that can see the whole, and which I think both Sri Aurobindo and McGilchrist agree should be the master, not the emissary. In our civilization the last few centuries, the emissary, the left brain, the selective attention, the exclusive concentration has taken over. And I was, so going from that to the current chapters, I noticed in each chapter with the mind and supermind, with life, and you'll see later with matter, he lays out these polarities where life on the one hand is trying to secure a can for itself, is trying to, it sees everything as fighting, as opposition. And then at a later stage, it begins to appreciate fusion, connection, and ultimately love. And the same with mind. Mind, he says, is a reflection of supermind. And these forms of attention that Gilchrist talks about, the analytic and intuitive or the left brain, right brain, these are reflections of functions in the supermental consciousness. So by learning to, 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 to balance these, to let go of our source of concentration, to open to a more what Janet and I call an open heartful awareness, which includes and integrates both the analytic and the intuitive. What Shubino is saying in this passage I read in the meditation is that as we ourselves, what we can do is prepare ourselves, is to notice really every moment gently and spontaneously where, are, where is the balance in terms of the pulling towards myself and the fusion? Where is the balance in the analytic and the connecting? And as that harmonizes, we just become spontaneously more open to that force. So with that, um, I, think, I think in the spirit of metapsychosis and the way moderation works here, I'm not suggesting any track, any themes, any whatever. I just sort of put that out there and whatever happens, happens. Though I'm happy to make suggestions if, if it's wished. 
Well, I, I do have perhaps an observation which might build on your, um, your thoughts there. I think this text is, would be extremely difficult, if not impossible, and I think that it may be extremely difficult or potentially impossible for a part of myself that does not believe in or have had experience of or would be willing to start with as a starting point in, in any mental process, any philosophical argument, that core experience of what Aurobindo calls Satchitananda. That is absolutely at the heart of, of this. And if your premise, I believe, is that there is n- nothing in the sense of nothing and that any kind of spiritual experience or reality arises out of materia- pure materiality in the sense of dead, inert, somehow active, but not alive or conscious or um, intelligent matter. I, I, I think Aurobindo in this text um, can only come across as an argument uh, that takes the characteristics of certain, let's say, idealist uh, um, metaphysics and I think that there's a reading of this text that could and would easily deconstruct many of its core notions. And so um, I'm not, you know, that, that, that's in the mix. I'm, that's not, I wouldn't associate that perspective with any particular person, any particular, it's just in the culture. Like it's part of that analytic mind that I that you talk about. And so we've talked a bit about this, some other threads and contexts. It seems to me that one of the things that we might need to do or could be able to do at least as uh, sort of service, <laughs> you know, to, 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 to thought is to translate a bit, to bridge from the language that in Aurobindo is a, almost a such a such a, a refined uh, expression of of a certain discourse of a certain kind of almost a culmination of certain discourses that synthesize in in this text, but which mm, I I think from from the contemporary like philosophical perspective. Uh, doesn't jive, right? So, um, at least that for me, that's one of the things I'm sensitive to. Uh, and I think that there are others like Debashish Banerjee who's also sensitive uh, to that issue and who in his writings, I have his book, The Seven Quartets of Becoming, uh, which I really am enjoying uh, so far. It, he's, he's creating, he's providing some of that um, some of that bridging, some of that maybe even neural connectivity. And I I do think the question of supermind and the brain is interesting. And I'm I'm curious what the brain is uh, from the perspective of supermind, (laughs) if we can speak of a perspective, uh, a solitary perspective anyway, of supermind. Yeah. It's like Johnny was about to talk, but I, I thought I would... yeah, yeah, I'll chime in if no one else is going to go for it. Oh, did you want to say something? I, I, it might be helpful to respond directly to Marco because I think it's a, it's a not, only, not only important, but like probably for us, a crucial fundamental point. If you want to take a look after this, I, 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 maybe some of you saw it. Um, I know in my enthusiasm, when I first talked to people about Sri Aurobindo, he can come across as cultish, and Jeffrey made a really great, great point about the a potential problem with the way Sri Aurobindo uses the word force, which seems to be in conflict with the way science uses it. 
Um, so what I did to get my non-cultish bona fides out on the, on the forum, I summarized, I'm the type of person when I go to Amazon, I go to the first star reviews always first. I go to, so I want to know like what's happening the whole way. So I summarized to the best of my awareness, eight or nine, I think it was eight of the, well, I thought the best arguments against everything the true has ever written. So I have one and I tried to state it, you know, authentically from that perspective. So I have an argument against his whole philosophy from the materialist point of view. There are Advaita Vedantins who just loathe everything he ever wrote. And I've read them quite a bit, so I try to summarize their arguments. Um, Devashish has a nice argument that he was too stuck in German idealist thought and shouldn't have used certain words. Um, your, our friend Eric has had a long-standing argument with a lot of Oribino people about what well, uses the word substance, but um, there's a couple more. Oh, uh, there, <laughs> Peter Hees lives at the ashram and has nearly been kicked out of India because he dare to present Shribindo as a real human being. So there's this whole school that says his mother, I think, was bipolar and psychotic. And his whole obsession with the mother for all those decades just to deal some therapeutic thing dealing with his mother, his crazy mother. So I think it's really, really good, especially in this, we're 100 years more separated from his language. It's really great to recognize we have our cultural mix. And some of that has seemed so foreign. And my last thing, Johnny, is I'll just say, it took me 20 years of resistance. I wouldn't even read The Life Divine between 76 and 96. I mean, I had all these doubts all that time. So my God, if you guys just could come across this and reading it, I'm totally amazed. Um, does someone else want to go? Okay. Um, thank you. Um, thank you, Don. Thank you, Marco. You, you, you both were uh, presenting stuff that was very of great use and interest to me. Um, and I was very able to read some of the stuff online uh, that you shared, Don, just very recently. Right before the call started, I looked at uh, some of the cr critiques that you reported of Aurobindo. And also you, you uh, quoted um, Owen Barfield, um, Saving the Appearances. And there's something that Barfield said about pre-modern modern people that I think is relevant because he said, the world for pre-modern people was like a garment that wrapped around them. And modern people, for modern people, the world is a platform upon which they stand. And so I think that's, um, and you know, but even in our present age, I think with um, outside of academic settings where people are very cognocentric and up in their heads, I think people still respond as if the world was wrapped around them, especially if they've smoked a joint or had any drugs <laughs> or they're or they're increasingly i think getting hypnotized by their uh devices <clears throat> i think there's a um so i don't think the uh the world is um so caught up in this modern um disenchantment as a lot of academics and um, philosophers pretend i think for many of us the world is is very magical and always has been. And so, but I do uh, do enjoy reading or a bit of his elevated diction. It's just like reading Moby Dick or something like that. It's just very, it's very highfalutin, you know. Um, but even with that sort of elevated diction, there's a, a personality that's there. But I'm very aware that um, he's coming from up here and he's coming down and that's not my experience of kundalini mine was came from below and up and all over the place so for me it was extremely wild and i you know i understand these are differences but i think my experience is of, of uh 
Kundalini, if you want to call it that, I think it's more common than, than his was. And I also, as a, you know, as a gay man, I'm, I'm very uninterested in um, the kind of Tantra that I think um, Aurobindo and the mother were embodying. Um, I'm much more into, and I, I'm borrowing on uh, Jeffrey Kripal, who wrote a study on Ramakrishna, who he, he claims was um, a gay um, tantric. Um, but that he, he sort of expresses a, an erotic uh, devotional side that I think is, um, I think that's what Kripal would call uh, that God is queering humanity, that there's a shift going on. And that seems much more relevant to me than the mother. Uh, you know, I, I, maybe it's just the, I think the, in American culture, our relationships with our mothers are extremely complicated and our mothers are often very complicated. Um, so we don't have, I think, the same sort of cultural um, affinity for the mother, I think, is, as is presented in this particular text. And in the ashram world, I think that Aurobindo and the mother were um, coming out of. So those are my uh, sort of gut responses. And also, I'm very uh, challenged because uh, I, I know Wilbur pretty well. And I know, um, I'm, I'm getting learned to learn I know Gebser well. I know a little bit of Steiner, but previously we had studied uh, an article by um, Gidley. And uh, Jennifer Gidley is looking at these three authors, Steiner, Gebser, and Wilbur, and she's mentioning Arbindo as um, presenting different versions of the integral. And I find that is what's most interesting to me is, is, is comparing and contrasting um, these major thinkers. And so Aurobindo is like, for me, filling in a lot of um, gaps. And it's, uh, it's, it's, but I think part of me, if I just relax and just sort of open up to his unique rhythms and I can find the beauty of that, um, which I initially did, but today as I was reading, I found myself lots of snags, probably because I read all those critical voices were sort of coming back in, into my awareness and were sort of, I could feel it was um, sort of getting superimposed on the text, which for me at first was just very shimmering and very charming and very uh, enjoyable, like an aesthetic um, it, it, uh, sort of relationship I was feeling with this author. Now I'm, now I'm feeling a, a little bit of a distance and they're in a critical distance. So that's where I'm at now, and I'm sure it's going to change and evolve. So thank you all very much. Um, I, I'm not really sure where to start. I, you know, Marco, you were saying how you don't feel like you've had, um, or you, you're not sure what that experience of super mind is that he's talking about, or, I mean, I don't know. I, I feel conflicted with it because on one hand, I'm like trying to be humble going, have I ever experienced that for real? Like, is it, have I ever even gotten that close that I think I have? Um, and just, and there's so many experiences that I've had where I feel like I have had glimpses of that, whether it be through dancing that became a meditation where I'm just experiencing full bliss and timelessness, um, or, like some incredibly traumatic yet like important experience in my life that 
gives me a glimpse into this greater reality where even though that thing was traumatic, it was perfect and meant to be and guided me to be exactly where I am in this play of existence. And, and then I can look back on those things and actually like take some strange delight in it. Like he's talking about with Supermind and, um, I don't know. I, I have odd, I feel like at odds with this sense that perhaps we will evolve out of our physical bodies in some way or beyond them and feeling like we're more like I, I would prefer if we transcended and included our physical body and allowed ourselves to still experience pleasure and pain, but at a different perspective of it or something like that, perhaps. Um, Cause I just think about certain things of life that, can just take me there almost in instantaneously. Like even just the delight, the bliss that I get from smelling a flower or watching stuff in my garden grow um, or my child growing. So tasting food, you know, I and mean, there's certain things that I feel like just can, if you're really present with it, it there's, it pushes you beyond the boundaries of our confined physical bodies. So I, I kind of hesitate to speak because I think I'm going to come across somewhat incoherent. Um, I liked uh, what you said, Marco, to begin with, because it, I think that was the feeling I had to start with. And because you said it, I already moved beyond it. Uh, sort of stuck on this. I mean, it came up in the in the exchanges on online. So, I, I mean, I do feel that there's a part of me that wants to read this text and not pay any attention to anybody else, just to read Aurobindo for Aurobindo and just take the lessons or the insights that he offers as gifts, as ways of thinking about the world, understanding that Aurobindo is starting from this place that is very different from the place that I would normally start from. But but I think there's something to be said for just reading it for Aurobindo. But part of the reason we're reading Aurobindo is because we're also reading all these other thinkers like Slaughter Dyke, the discussion on Slaughter Dyke, or the discussion on the minor gesture with Aaron Manning or, or some of the fiction reading and writings that we've been sharing uh, with each other. And, and so even though there's a part of me that just wants to read Aurobindo for Aurobindo, there's another part of me wants to see how it fits within this larger puzzle, what Marco, you referred to the field that is that is coming into being in this context. And, and so that's where, so it's, so the, some of the more critical pieces come in there, but I don't know how, I don't really understand how it fits within the larger piece. So that's a, a question or a frustration or a, a feeling I have, maybe it's, maybe it's just a feeling. Um, there was a couple of things I noticed as I went through, and again, maybe it's because I'm an intellectual and they appeal to me on an intellectual level, but I, I, I remember when I got, I think it was the end of chapter 11. Uh, so that, that was maybe last week's reading, but I was still catching up. Um, so 
this idea that he says um, subconscious in matter, superconscious beyond mind, this delight seeks in mind and life to realize itself by emergence in the becoming, in the increasing self-consciousness of the movement. Anyway, I underlined that little section because what suddenly struck me as I was reading this is this idea that, and, and maybe I misunderstood Aurobindo, but what I heard is that the idea of the pain, so it's the chapter dealing with the presence of pain in the world, that the idea if, is that pain can be dealt with in a context where there is a transformation in process of becoming and the pain is managed through the transformation, which I thought was a really interesting and something that I hadn't necessarily thought of that way. So it was for me a new insight that I got from Aurobindo. The other thing that I got from Aurobindo in the reading is this, so the supermind, the concept is a bit difficult, I think, to try and fully understand what he's talking about. It took me a while to feel my way into it. But what I liked about it is this idea that it's an intermediate structure. So it's not the ultimate structure. It's this transition thing between the mind and, uh, I can't say the word, <laughs> Marco, but uh, that's, that's so, not so quite. Under. <laughs> so it's this transition phase, uh, which I thought was also a, 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 an insight that I found useful for thinking about these things. But on the other hand, there's a lot of words in here, and I stumbled on all the uh, on on the repetitions that are in the text, you know. So I found myself tending to skip forward over the text some of the time. And um, I try to read every word, but it gets, it gets hard to be disciplined to do that. You want to skip forward when the text starts repeating itself. So that's another issue that I have with the text. So... Um, Anyway, maybe I'll just stop there because it's a bit of a mix. On that, Jeffrey, uh, I just want to report my own experience this past week. I actually only read one chapter that and I never do that I'm a good student I'm a great like an A student I always do the homework but I did it differently this time and the reason is because I found or somebody linked to recordings audio recordings of a person named Shred Shredavan I believe Shredavan mm -hmm. Shredavan reading uh, chapter by chapter and so what I did and I didn't mean to I meant to read the text I just didn't get to it but I meditated with the readings and, and I, so I really, I, so I can't skip anything. Right. And also she reads very slowly and she, I'd say, uh, creates a kind of trance, uh, state, a kind of experience that I think transmits the meaning, intent, force even of, of the text in a different way. And I, I would recommend that to anyone who, um, and maybe has trouble with just reading the text because it's not it's it's a tran it's a beyond more than an intellectual experience that way uh and it kind of almost forces it because you, you can't parse the language when her voice continues uh moving uh so just that That was exactly what I was going to suggest to you, Jeffrey, too, because I've been doing the same thing. Um, I just don't seem to have the 
ripe amount of time, I suppose. I've got two children and they're it's summer. They're staying up later. So, but I can always put in some earbuds while um, doing gardening work or later at night doing this and that. And also while driving on to and from work. Um, so she had, um, if you want to announce her name again, somebody, that'd be nice. But <laughs> um, she, Shradavan. Shradavan has really assisted me this time around. I've, I've already read the text, but um, that was 10 years ago. And to, and I, there's, there's some feeling which is going around in general that it, it's almost unnecessary for us to read the full text um, in, a, in a way. I, I, I feel it's necessary at some point to get a grasp on the concepts and the cosmos that's being created around the text. But, <clears throat> and I've come to the conclusion that I, we, we might all be an embodiment of this cos cosmology forming. And if you want to see it at different levels, you can, but there's the sleep cycle and there's your waking up and, um, but, the, but there is kind of, going off of what Lauren was getting at that like, is am, like, am I feeling this? Have I glimpsed it? Like, ha, do I, do I know the super mind? Have I felt that? Or do I even know my own mind? Um, will my body remain type of thing? Those questions arise for me as well. And um, as soon as I let go of that, then it's there as um, Don read in the letter or his the introductory letter there that there's kind of that not necessarily a letting go, but the just general awareness, the presence that or you'll, you'll, the force will be forced within you or the being of her being. I, I don't know the whole letter. I'd like to read it over and over again, maybe, but um, yeah. So Check out the audio recordings. They're very helpful. <laughs> Along with everything else. Just do it all. Um, I'm curious, Don, to hear your ideas from what we were talking about last week, what you said the mother said about our organs and our evolution, um, how you interpret that. I actually thought of that both as you and Johnny were talking about the Kundalini and the body and pleasure and pain. Um, I, I read that book, by the way. Satra? Yeah. The Satra, yeah. 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 So I'm, I am, I'm very familiar with the way she expresses herself, and she is a very compelling read, for sure. Yeah. Um, yeah, if I was going to recommend an introduction to the integral yoga, Life Divine is probably the last book I'd, I'd recommend. That's why, yeah, Mateo's nodding his head. Um, you know, for sure, but over the last century, the most popular books from the ashram have always been these little excerpts from letters where he actually sort of speaks normal English, almost. Um, but in terms of what you're saying, wow. Okay, so here's one. Here's one. You know, in talking about the supermental experience, I mean, Truman and the mother both said, just for, don't even use that word for about 40 years. Just don't talk about it. But what Lauren was saying about, you know, with a child or a flower, it's like everyone has intuitions, intimations, the psychic being, the soul. I'll just use the word soul. I'm never crazy about the word psychic being. So here's, and this, I think this speaks to what Johnny was talking about too. Many years ago, I was playing for, um, I was out in Santa Cruz, California, and I spent the summer working on, um, I was accompanying a trio of dancers. 
And I remember as we were getting close to the performance, it was sort of a structured improv. So, you know, they started as a trio, then each had a solo and came back together. And I had a basic structure for the music, but I improvised also. And for some reason, the last solo and the transition to the end just never worked. This is like two months. It never worked. We had a week left. It was 7.30 in the morning. It was one of those classrooms at Santa Cruz where you can see out to the ocean or the full you know, glass window out to the redwoods and everything. And this guy, John Schrader, was playing saxophone. He stopped in to look on. A friend of theirs, Lorna, stopped to look on. And as Holly did the, her last solo, suddenly the sun rose, shone into the room. Everyone knew something took over. And as all the three dancers came back, we burst out into the most ecstatic, joyous laughter. Every movement, every note was perfect. And it was as if there was one being playing through all of us. This is not some big, cosmic, incredible, oh my God, spiritual experience. This to me is like just, you know, what Johnny was saying, there's, there's, a, there's an energy there, kind of a wild energy that just took us over. But it's also the beauty and gentleness and lightness of the soul. And I've always found that even reading The Life Divine, you know, when I talked last week about, uh, Lauren brought up the thing about pleasure and pain, is that, you know, since everyone has an intimation, you know, what Wordsworth talked about, intimate intimations of immortality, he wasn't talking about some spaceless, formless awareness. He was talking about this love that was rolling through all things. To me, that's very much the quality of the soul. And if you have that, if you can allow, and you do, when you can allow that feeling of that, reading the life divine is a completely, utterly different experience. So I, I made some mistakes by, I think I was a little overly reactive or critical to Wilbur, and some of you may have noticed in the letters, and I kind of, you know, dialed it back, went back and forth. But I think what I really was trying to say is that if you're familiar with Steiner and Gidley's work and Bonita Roy and, and Wilbur and Gepser, you know, I found that the hardest thing for me reading Shura Bindo is I come from all those people. And, and over the years, I kept having to shed, not, that I, not about right or wrong, just he's saying something different. And so sort of let go of the, I'm not getting to Lauren's thing. Anyway. You bring the soul quality to it, it's different. Um, yeah, so I think what the mother is saying is not that you get rid of or transcend the body. I mean, she spent the last 20 years of her life going literally, as she described it, it's going to sound crazy. I mean, you think anything she ever wrote sounds crazy. You read the 13 volumes of, Teo knows, 13 volumes of Mother's Agenda, this woman is just like, you thought Triabino's mother was crazy, you know? This woman was wacko, right? She's like going into the trillions of billions of cells in her body and describing to Sat Pratt was just like, oh my God, you know, well, it's like it's a cell, but it's the entire universe, but it's Russia. I can feel the Russian invasion happening here, and there's Khrushchev, and there's, you know, some rock star. I just, so it's like she's a body, but she's not a body, and she's like, having to sort of hold on or the, or the body would just explode. So I'll just I'll close this thought by saying, if you can, you know, allow for what Jeffrey said was a very, you know, very rich intellectual appreciation, bring in the wildness of what Johnny said about the Kundalini appreciation, bring in that soul qualities that Lauren was describing, appreciating the flower and the child, and you just allow all of that into the, the whole thing into the mix. And it becomes a dance rather than just a struggle to go with words, which is why Shradavan's reading is so helpful. I, I have a, last thing, I have a canto of savagery on my flash drive in my car. And I've been on news fast more or less for weeks. So I don't listen to the radio anymore, which is great. So I put in Shradavan, it's like, Soul speaks to its gulfs. You know, just silence, you know. 
and your body and your and the street and the and the car is honking and the so and so, you know, and the homeless guy in the corner are just all embraced by the silence and the richness of energy too. Okay. Uh, we're at the top of the hour, and uh, there's somebody in the waiting room. In the past, we've opened it up at this point. The name is familiar. It's not a name. It's the tag. So I'm going to let them in, and you can take a breath, and then continue. I'll also say that uh, I need to leave exactly, or at least close to the close to the top of the hour of the next hour, uh, to get to another event. Uh, but uh, I'll leave, and at the bottom, let us say at 7.30 my time, if anybody needs to leave then, we can also create a little pause. So let's see who's who's with us now. Hello? Hi there. Hi. Thanks for letting me in. Welcome. What's your name? Oh, um, my name's Fred Dolan. And I'm in uh, Berkeley, California. And, uh, I'm here at the kind invitation of Kim. Um, and I guess I should say my interest in, in our Vinoda book is it's more theoretical and philosophical, I suppose, than practical. But i um, hoping to find some stimulation. Okay. We've been talking for the last hour, so you may not get the, all the context, uh, but... The way that we're working is that we keep on mute. And I don't know if you're familiar with Quaker meetings, but it's kind of like the idea is if the spirit quote, spirit speaks through you, let it speak. If Otherwise, the silence is okay too. And so we're all on mute. And when someone wants to speak, they just unmute themselves I see. And, and speak. And you can, if you use the gallery view, you can see who else is muted or unmuted. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so uh, feel free. So someone in Oroville has done us a great service in turning the 13 volumes of the agenda into a two volume set called the mother's yoga. It's just two, two small volumes, but it is pretty intense to read still. And she's highlighted out what she, um, what she determines as the yogic passages. So cut a lot of the history out and things like that. It's interesting, but the, the um, book that people have been talking about Sat Prem's mind of the cells, that's, kind of a wonderful introduction to uh, the mother's agenda. And there's another um, wonderful introduction called notes on the way that are actually edited. So the special thing about notes on the way is it's part of the collected works of the mother, but talks that were recorded by Sat Prem that were represented to her and then published in the various journals that the ashram had at the time. Mother India, the Journal on Sports Education, things like that. Yeah, Notes on the Way, really, it's uh, polished, very polished in comparison to trying to get through the 13 volumes of the agenda. So I I wanted to talk a little bit about about, uh, how I uh, approach Life Divine. These chapters might get even more more difficult. Um, You know, I don't know, maybe maybe they'll get more easy. I don't want to taint anything like that. Um, But I probably approach it a lot. I haven't heard Shradavan's reading. Um, I've heard her reading Savitri and it's, it's lovely. Uh, But I I read slowly and I read um, mantrically almost not quite like I was chanting the Veda, the the second session, but um, I pause between paragraphs and uh, my, my goal is, my, my goal is to have my mind go completely silent and go completely uncritical in that way. Um, I, I don't have the advantage. I, I have the advantage and disadvantage of not having all these authors to cross-reference with Sri Aurobindo. I don't have uh, any background in 
philosophy and I'm very um, poorly read in that sense. So I, I, I approach it like with as bringing as much meditative concentration as possible and then, and then uh, getting my mind to go as, as quiet as I can possibly make it. And then having like a first tier goal of, of presence that that to me is like the most difficult hurdle to get across just coming into presence with the, with the words. And then after that, I'm kind of working up to contact and relation with, uh, with, with either remembered experience or a priori it, or a priori leading to experience or a relation with something that the soul already knows and the quieting of the mind. I feel like there's a, I sense more of a, a listening from the heart or behind the hearts. And, and I, I, I guess kind of beyond that, I mean, I can, we can talk, there's so much here in these last chapters that we read that, I'd love to bring to the table the triple status of supermind is fascinating. The, the, the problem of pain and the, uh, the solution, the, he brings in such an evolutionary solution and then, but, but brings us through these classic philosophical arguments of the question of pain, not arising Unless we have, it only arises out of an Abrahamic conception of God, God as other. As soon as, as soon as uh, the soul comes into knowledge, the the question is the divine. The question is of human egoic distortion rather than, rather than a horrible God doing bad things to us and standing back and watching. But then it's also seems, it seems again, I don't have the basis of comparison, but it seems quite ad, ad, advanced to present the background of existence being bliss where it, with Buddhism, you know, all life is suffering, I think is the first tenant of Buddhism. This is the exact opposite of that suffering and pain are simply like the background is bliss and suffering and pain is noise to that signal noise on the background. And then uh, the, what the third argument was uh, uh, the uh, uh, pain and suffering or, or na- natural catastrophes or murders, all these things are uh, questions uh, in a, that, that arise out of a mental ethical realm. But then the, the, the evolutionary dealings in that chapter and the next chapter that, that, uh, that, that pain is the, the, the human distortion and the pain are the evolutionary spurs that are helping us to open up the, the ranges of our being, the ranges of our consciousness. This is, uh, um, I, I, this is of the highest order for me to attempt to uh, contact and practice and uh, realize and 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 to be and uh, this uh, reading the reading the life divine to me is just it's it's beautiful it's it's bathing in um it's it's bathing in really beautiful poetry and i approach it from a really uh, from a mantric kind of really trying to get the mind to go quiet and the heart to to open and to receive. And this is incredibly difficult. I don't mean to glamorize uh, my position as if I can uh, do what I'm talking about. This is uh, like, in, in all honesty, I would be lucky to be able to get there in two minutes every hour or something like that. But it's, it doesn't, it, it kind of, it doesn't, it hasn't stopped me in my approach. And that's that's probably it for now. Oh, I'd I'd love to talk about the put the triple status of supermind on the table too, but maybe a little bit later. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to address. Actually, the first thought was I'd like to address what Matteo said about the triple status of supermind. But I want to say one more thing about reading Life Divine, what you brought up, um, which is really interesting. So if you hang out for any length of time with disciples, you know. In integral yoga, you will hear over and over again 
they will quote Mother and Shirobendo, who both said endlessly, you, can, you should not try and think about it. You should read it with a silent mind, exactly as Matteo said, in presence, right? And I think for the first 20 years that I knew it, I, I literally had a discipline refused to let myself try and analyze and figure it out. I would always try and read it magically in presence. But if you go back to 1914, when he started writing it, when he explained his purpose in the journal, the Aria, he said, I am writing this to convey spiritual truths to the human intellect. So I don't think you, I think you have to sort of hold both those together. Because he did say, but the mind can't understand this. So what's going on? He's writing for the intellect, but the intellect can't understand it. So for me, it's a pretty simple integration, which is that I think, you know, if it's not too uncomfortable when you want to get an intellectual understanding, you will probably get more in what, ter- what uh, Matteo is saying, that by bringing presence, listening mantrically, and if you can stay, you know, the Tibetan Buddhists have a way of describing this, this kind of meditation. You start with, sta- you do a stabilizing meditation, which is coming into presence, mantric, and then when it kind of fades, do some analyzing, and you can bring them together anyway. So let's try it with a triple status of supermind. So there's a great passage. He doesn't make explicit life divine, but elaborates on in one of his letters. He says, for the triple status, one, the highest, well, it's not highest, one is recognizing the self, the, the, that divine consciousness, as all. And this, he says, was the sort of core realization of the Advaita Vedantins, this oneness or non-dual. You can also recognize all in the self. So there's still, there's a relationship now between the manifestation and the, and the self, but there's still a very deep connection. And that is actually the realization of the qualified non-dualist, which is one of the devotional schools in India and very much fits part of Christianity and Islam and part of Judaism. There's another a third realization, which is now closer to the mind, where differentiation is more more prominent, you recognize the self in each. So now you're really looking at, you're going from what total oneness to oneness in many to the many, but still connected to the one. And when you have exclusive concentration, you lose the one altogether and you only have the many. So he's teaching us intellectually that these three philosophies, which have been fighting for, for millennia, and in some version, um, West and East, are actually looking at through the mind at different phases of the supermind and fighting, saying they're different. He's saying, no, there's an integration. That, that was very helpful, Don. Um, what's coming up for me, and this is hugely speculative on my part, and I'm just sort of improv here, something that um, I think it was Banerjee talked about, the post-secular age. I was very curious what that could be. Um, but you, I was thinking about the each is in the all, and the all is in the each, and the each and the all are in the one. And Aurobindo sort of repeats this many times. And that sort of reminds me of Plotinus. It's very um, almost like um, Neoplatonic. Um, and, I, and I'm curious, and I, and I am, when I'm really, what I want to be able to do is to read historically um, and not to bring any of my, too much of my, modern, postmodern uh, perplexities and conundrums and project them, all those questions onto this text, which he, I don't think, is going to be able to answer because he was living 100 years ago in, in very different circumstances. But I'm just wondering if the subtle realm that I think he's so um, adept at exploring and articulating from and as difficult as that was for him, I think it's even more difficult for us, knowing what we know, 
and knowing what we know about you know neuroscience and uh, yet many of us are having dreams and synchronicities and uh, paranormal experiences and I think that maybe that the subtle worlds may be evolving our, certainly our relationships to these subtle realms are evolving and the subtle worlds themselves through our participation as observing participants are 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 changing as well I think I'm borrowing here from Eric Weiss who said as the middle structure starts to enter into uh, the magical and the subtle the subtle realms you can't what are the instruments of measurement that you could use and there aren't any really uh, so the deficient mental can't really enter into those realms at all and tends to evade them or avoid them or just say it's just bullshit or fantasy but the, for those who can bring the mental structure the healthy mental structure um, can bring perspective into those subtle realms and ask certain kinds of questions and and do different kinds of experiments which will get very which will create a different kind of many different kinds of relationships and i would suspect that there could be a lot of crossover effects from what was you know subtle physical to something that's neither subtle nor physical and both subtle and physical and i think this is something that that the mother i think her language is sort of um, sort of reflects that sort of blending. Um, in a way, I don't think this particular text uh, Arbindo does because he is, he is so serene. Um, but anyway, those are just my hunches here. I, I think that because um, I had a, I had an experience where I I was in this I was in a lucid dream and there was a very beautiful um, beautiful man. I, it was an erotically charged. Um, devotional uh, energy but rather than acting upon that I asked him a question I said who are you bringing my mental capacity for um, perspective and he said well I am you and I was like well how can you be me because I was still holding on to this subject object um, and he, there were others there, and he sort of went and he, he had this little communion with these other entities. And then he came back to me and he said, in answer to that question, he said, we share the same heart. And that satisfied me. It just made sense that, oh, we share the same heart. So then you and I are, I suppose, one. And it became much more of a meditative space and this intense uh, lower chakra sort of um, erotically charged space. So it was much more of a blend. Anyway, I bring that up because I think there's, um, I think it's, I think that's a similar territory. I think that the mother and the, and Aurobindo with their experiences of the subtle, I think it's a, but I think we have, we have different maps that are emerging out of this kind of, um, these kinds of exchanges. But I think it leaves an imprint. And that imprint, I think, in the physical, in the waking world, is, um, is there. Even though you do your ordinary stuff and you wash dishes and you do your job and you function in a social, social world which doesn't honor this kind of stuff, it's still, uh, you're still, you're aware of it. Part of you is still aware of it and connected to that field of all possibility. So anyway, I guess this is uh, a rehearsal space for me just to sort of um, get these uh, sort of fragmented, uh, half formulated kind of thoughts out into a, an open kind of social space. So this is a, a great benefit to me. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Thanks, thanks, Jenny. I just, I'm aware. I'm very aware. There's four people who haven't spoken. That's. I just want to touch on something that may sort of tie over. Um, Johnny mentioned a really important thing about the post secular, which I think is related to the upsurge of nationalism around the world, the claim that liberal democracy around the world may be dying. I don't mean liberal like liberal conservative, but the, the modern Enlightenment project. 
Um, it's a very ex existential question in India, which Debashish may be referring to. Um, I'll say more about that later, so I won't let other people speak. But something I heard recently in terms of those subtle forces and things mixing the death of liberal democracy, someone referred to Gepser's deficient magic consciousness saying that Trump's tweets are magic spells and just, it made so much sense to me. I, I think I posted that. There's a, I think it's Gary Lockman has written a book on it. Yeah. just want to add one comment off what you said, John, about are there any instruments, I think? And it sounds like we are the instruments in a certain way. And we're just the accounts, our Obendo's account and your account, John, of exploring the subtle realms. So, yeah. I just wanted to add one thing that the, when, I asked, when he said, we share the same heart, he didn't say we share the same brain. <laughs> and I think that's very significant. I don't know why. Uh, so there was a, um, a thought that uh, I'm a bit of a slow thinker, and this is related to something, things that what Lauren said at the beginning and what Don said at the beginning and what Johnny said at the beginning. So, you know, it's, 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 it's getting there, but it takes time. Um, so Lauren talked about the connection to the feeling connection to the larger soul, the, the larger engagement, right, with the with the spiritual life, right? Through the flower or the child or, and Don talked about selective attention versus peripheral attention or what I call peripheral, but I, I think we, we understand that. Anyway, it's just a, a question of terminology. John, you talked about the erotic connection, which I also found very interesting. And it's not something that, shows up in Aurobindo at, that I have seen so far. Per, perhaps there's something about it, but it's not what I've seen. But what those three things, so in the other discussion that we had this week on uh, with another text called The Minor Gesture, we talked about autism and the autist experience. And in that context, uh, we were talking about the fact that uh, for people with autism, they have a different understanding of um, or a different way of relating to the world, and that they the, the many that the division into objects is not clear for them that they that they don't see the division between people in the same way we do so for instance it was being discussed that when somebody is moving in the environment of somebody with autism they tend to feel that they themselves are moving in some sense in and so the movement of the other carries them or they carry the movement of the other people so there's this broader sense but what i'm getting at is um so it, the one of the difference between people with autism and what yeah, uh, what the language tends to call neurotypical as opposed to neural diverse is that uh, people with autism don't chunk 
or they their chunking is delayed or retarded. So the the way they chunk the environment into objects is delayed and retarded. Anyway, the reason I'm sort of getting into it is is I'm looking for, again I'm looking for connections between the different discussions. So this so the the question I have is is this is this possibility of learning to not chunk as much, which I relate. So the, the, the question of attention is related to inhibition because selective, in, uh, the reason we selectively attend is we inhibit the things that we don't pay attention to. The natural human capacity is to attend and we inhibit it in order to selectively attend. And so in order to stop selectively as attending, you have to lift your tendency to inhibit, and then the world comes in in a un, un, more unfiltered way. So that seems to me closely related to this issue of being connected to a broader, more spiritual, more larger so I, engagement. So I'm, I, it's a question I have, but I think there may be there's something interesting there to pursue in, in, in terms of understanding these things. I'm not sure if that's clear to people. So. It's, it's a really interesting connection you just made, Jeffrey. Um, you know, McGillicrist has a theory that actually people with autism are much more in left brain selective attention. So it's interesting. I, I evaluate the psychologist, a lot of autistic children and teenagers and some adults. And as you were talking, it struck me, both forms of attention seem to work differently with them. And I'm just, I'm remembering one boy who was 13 and he was rather intelligent. And his mother was as furi furious that he could never take like two or three commands from her. So I talked to him about it and I had them both come in together. I said, you know, when you tell him, go upstairs, put your, get ready for school, go upstairs, make your bed, brush your teeth and put your clothes on, he's totally, absolutely, I said, I said to him, tell her, he said, I feel like screaming, I'm completely overwhelmed, there's this cloud of stuff coming at me. So I see people two days, so I said, next time, tell him, brush your teeth, come and tell me, make your bed, come and tell me. And she came in the next day and he said, he was ecstatic. He said he could like filter and process all this stuff like, oh, this is the world I'm living in. So I think what you're seeing there, this, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna do a quick, we have, I think we have time, an overview of the whole, up to, up to our present chapter, like one sentence each. And I think if you take it all in terms of attention, it's very powerful. So in chapter one, Sri Bhanu talks about an aspiration, which as I said, since we all have contact, intimations of the soul, that's the aspiration of the soul, but we rarely pay attention to it. So the entire yoga could be just learning to attend to that. And what we've done is, in losing connection to the soul, we've either, this is chapters two and three, gone to the extreme of just saying, well, let's get rid of this manifestation which is so horrible and evil and go to the spirit, or the revolt against that saying, it's all matter, it's all physical, that's it. And so Sri Aurobindo is taking us through the next four or five chapters through the sense it's an omnipresent, integral reality, and there are these Vedantic knowledge of an intuition, which, to get back to what Jeffrey said, is molding and integrating and playing wildly, as Johnny said, with many different, there's a body attention, there's a life force attention, there's a mental, emotional attention, and there's all kinds of intuitive, different kinds of attention, which you can't figure out. But when you're, you know, playing the piano or playing basketball or you're writing a philosophic essay, if you attend or improvise, for me, improvising piano, if you attend to this, you'll see these different forms of attention. So when I'm working with an autistic child, I can recognize what's he, what he's going through if I've contacted that attention in myself. So then he takes, he's now, then he, Sri takes us through being consciousness bliss. And he's really just saying, you know, as Matteo said, if you're in presence and getting this mantrically, if you're in touch with that aspiration from chapter one, and you have a feeling of being and the, the energy of consciousness 
and the delight of that, then you, that's a different way of reading the life divine. Then we, now we get into the problems, right? So now we're in the point where, well, there's this supramental consciousness which brings it all together. There's this divine soul. But there's this exclusive concentration, which he's going to tell us about later, which divides life, divides mind and supermind, divides matter. And so we end up in this world where the Buddha says, as the world is now, because the Buddha was really saying the same thing as the Buddha ends up saying, no, there is nirvana, there is delight. But as the world is now, because of this, this divided attention, it's a world of suffering. Well, isn't that Superman's fault? <laughs> All right. Um, I mean, isn't the critique of Supermind appropriate then? I mean, not just as a concept, but as a reality? You have to like, experience it to be able to critique it. I, don't, I mean, so far, you know, we're just trying to to imagine what, what he could mean by that. But there's, you know, you know what I mean. Let's say I'm torturing a cat. <clears throat> Sorry, what did you say? So let's say I'm torturing a cat, a kitten. <laughs> A cat, a living being. Okay. And I don't want to be too graphic. John, actually, we can share the story. I think it was of a cat that he saw crucified. Is that not Supermind? Probably, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. What, what's, what's the exact definition of, uh, of Supermind? <laughs> well uh my just a riff to riff on what i got from the text i, I think um the author the creator of all all reality all con all, all experience experienced and experienceable uh reality and you know we as individuals concentrate that into an experience of particularity particular self but i think what aurobindo is saying is that if you go deeper than that then you find that there is a layer of reality which is a universal experience it's that it's coming from the same heart but it's expressing itself through a multiplicity we concentrate into a multiplicity but through intensifying our attention we can break through that um limit and experience a universality and then the you know, we can experience the aspects or the, the, the triple status, I think you called it, of, of supermind, the one and all, the, uh, the all and each. Uh, and so, I mean, it, I think if we take that seriously, I mean, he lays it out partly as a kind of phenomenology, partly as a logical argument. At one point, he says that supermind is a logical necessity, which I thought was cool, actually, like, because he's he's really fucking with the mind <laughs> in a way and i i um i want to just challenge the uh the sense i and i i love the bliss i love the delight of existence i love the um the being consciousness uh sort of evocation that the like that being the core reality is beautiful i much preferable to to not you know nothing um, but if history is reality then, and history is an expression of this supermind coming into being and coming into coming, become, becoming itself, uh, then like, isn't that, I guess what I'm saying is like, we have to, the, 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 the recognition of supermind can't just be in 
and as much as I totally agree and with Lauren, you like children, flowers. I walk outside in Colorado in the summertime, and it's it's like I love Supermind, right? Because Supermind has brought this paradise in a way. Um, of course, it's a bubble though, because we can go outside of those edges and and see real suffering. And of course, we can not just we can tune into that, right? We can attune with that. And I know that there is this delight aspect that Aurobindo wants us to see. But if we allow, let's say, the ethical to to come, like to come online, right? And more than the ethical, it's because it's not just a judgment of the mental. It's like horror, right? It's disgust. It's moral revulsion, right? At what we see. We can't say, well, that's that person's fault, this particular person's fault, or this group's fault. Like, that is ultimate reality right there. No? I just had an experience of um, another uh, another lucid dream. There was a... I knew I was in front of... There were three, three entities up on a platform, elevated platform. And I knew they were very intelligent, much smarter than me. And I asked them about a past life. I said, who was I? in my past life and they said are you sure you want to know and i said yes who was i in my past life and they said are you sure you want to know and i said yes the third time yes i want to know who was i in my past life and they they said you were adolf hitler and i went oh <laughs> you know i was filled with doubt at that point that these these entities were legitimate but if they had told me I was Cleopatra or that I was uh, some gifted saint, I might have thought they were even smarter than I thought they were at first. But I just woke up very perplexed and I realized on some level, well, it's true. I was Hitler. And so are you and so are all of us. And we were also everyone who was tortured in a, in a concentration camp. Um, and I think that's where there is that level where all of it is beautiful. Even though that part of us are disgusted and revolted. So I see this, uh, this as cosmic parts work. You know how you do in gestalt therapy, there's two chairs and you put one part over here and then you get up and put another part over there and they, you create a dialogue between these different parts and hopefully there's enough integration that happens. I think we're, we're having to do this at a cosmic level as well. And I think there's an evolution that's happening. And I think, I think God is evolving along with us. I don't think there's this, you know, we are, and I think we are no longer becoming what we were becoming. We're constantly updating ourselves. And not just our species, other species as well are, are, are active participants in our own evolution as humans. So we're, we're I think, having to update ourselves uh, how we're going to move into a, an ecological civilization. Um, these are the big questions that keep me motivated. So anyway, that's a great insight that she was sharing. And I'm just putting that out there. Because I've looked at, I've seen horrible things like that co- that cat that was tortured in my biology ca- class, and it was I thought it was horrifying, and I never quite got over it. But I think you know, God was the cat getting crucified. So um, it's it's I think it's parts work. I may be wrong, but I have a funny feeling that the more versatile we are with this with the theater, theatrical nature of our cosmos, I think the better we're going to get along. Knowing we're just playing the villain today, we're playing the hero the next day, and we're playing antagonists, and um, you know, hopefully we can get off this, this, this drama cycle into something that so our hidden agendas could be more transparent. I think it would subside and have more interesting aesthetic experiences probably than the ones we're having now. That would be my expectation. 
I want to say something. When I when I read this um, the last chapter on the Satchit Ananda, you know, where this uh, comes a lot. Yeah, do you hear me? Am I? Ah, louder. Okay, <laughs> sorry. Uh, I uh, I just look for the Christian um, concept of Trinity, right? And I try to uh, re rethink uh, that whole thing of Father, Son, and Holy Ghost being like the same thing, right? But in like different, uh, I don't know how to say, aggregates, like, you know, water as water and ice and uh, let's say steam, you know, anyway. So, um, yeah. That, uh, I don't know, that just made me to rethink the thing. And I also wanted to tell one dream to answer to, to Marco and also to add to, um, to John that I had a few years ago. I, was, I had a big house with a really beautiful garden, right? And um, I was in that house and I felt like really comfortable. And suddenly there were these people, like these strangers, having barbecue on my uh, property, right? They basically just broke in and, uh, you know, made their party there in my house. So I started, you know, arguing with them, trying to throw them out. And, you know, things um, went, went a little off. And then we started fighting. And in the end, I was just, you know, fighting them with this huge sword and cutting them in half. It was terrible, you know. It was a huge conflict. And then it was like a cut in the scene. And we were all together, all these people that I had fought with, you know, I was trying to get off my uh, property and that I killed, you know, that I terrible things too. And uh, they, they told me that they were just actors, you know, to, to do this uh, play with me, you know. And there was all this group was overwhelming feeling, right? To see all these people in, in front of me. And uh, then they were all looking at me and suddenly it struck me that I'm one of them, right? So that we are like all this uh, thing. And, and maybe that's what, what we're trying to, both of you were trying to say, that we are basically suffering for each other. That's yeah, how he explains the problem of, uh, of suffering. That there is no objective, objective um, reality. There's just this one subjective uh, being that's going through the process. And as you were speaking, I, I record another, um, another quote from the Upanishads. Maybe I, I just end, um, end with that. And as far as I recall, it was um, saying there is no objective being by knowing this all is known yeah. well i find i find your metaphor about the actors acting on your property and you at first thought that they were were not actors and um, that's how I see words, that they're all kind of like actors. And I see a whole chapter in the text that we were supposed to read today uh, that the whole chapter was, was about word definitions from my perspective because most of us are like ships crossing in the night when it comes to understanding what other people are really meaning by a particular word or a phrase or something like that, because there's just so many different kinds of nuances to words. And we tend to put our own, we paste our own meaning and visualizations and inner talk and all of that on, on our words. And then we say them when we think that everybody understands us. And really those words are just actors in some kind of interesting way to my notion. And, and I see Aurobindo uh, really setting us up in these first chapters in the life divine so that we will really, uh, if, if we really pay attention to the way that he's defining things, and he's, he's got multiple words and paragraphs around one word often, uh, trying to help us really get down to the, to the nitty-gritty of what he means by that word. And... Uh, uh, so for me, when I read Aurobindo, uh, well, I certainly can't say that I that I uh, am any kind of a tantric or meditative state. Uh, what I what I do do is is try and uh, empty my mind of my own meanings of those words and try and really get what he is trying to say, and uh, not not twist his meaning or or 
paste my meaning on some of those words and and I find that that entirely new meanings and understandings come up that I would not have have gotten if I had uh, not paid attention to to what he means by those words and what I mean by those words so um, uh, I find his writing quite interesting because he uh, you know, every time you read him, you can get a whole another la- another layer of meaning, and um, so um, I guess that I'm um, I'm fascinated by his writing. I'm fascinated by the way he's trying to convey an experience that he has, uh, his own phenomenological understanding to us knowing that words are, are fools, they're actors, and how can he play the drama with words in a way that, that we're going to get the experience that he is really trying to point us to. Uh, I, I think he's exquisite in his way of words and his way of working. And, and uh, you know, my poor book is, uh, it is a... <laughs> I, I've gone through it so many times, there's not much left of the book, you know, and I still find that there are places where I am not paying attention. You might say paying attention, but but there's also a, a vaster awareness that attention arises within and the words arise within all of that. And how do you let go of, of the social construction of reality around words and word meanings to really step into and step out of? of um you know something that he might be experience might have experienced or might have really uh, uh, uh is trying to convey to us that that um that we may not really know so that's a little bit about the process i'm going through when i'm reading his work again I'd like to echo something really wonderful that Terry, a great point you just made. Um, I think it's my experience too, that reading the first book, these first 30 or so chapters, 25 or so chapters, he really is just setting you up. He's just, he's just inviting you to enter his world. And the most important part of the book he, he wrote six entire, the last six chapters he wrote from scratch in the 1940s near the end of his life. And he had, had, as he said, four major reconfigurations of his entire philosophical outlook. Um, and that brings me back to Marco's comment about the uh, tortured cat and, the, and, you know, what's the supermind up to? And Terry brought up the thing of, of this, this fits in with what Matteo was saying about bringing silence and presence to the reading, that I have found repeatedly over now four decades of reading this book that I discover again and again I have been filtering what he says through a certain construction. For I think in the 70s, it was through very much through Wilbur, who I was reading a lot back then. It was through Gebser. It was through Whitehead. It was through um, actually... One of my biggest struggles was I refused to believe that Shankara and Nagarjuna had not, the Buddhists and, and Advaitas, had not found the ultimate truth forever. This was a perennial, right? So I spent a whole summer in 96 breaking through that. So here's a good, this for Marco, here's a good experiment. You'll know you're breaking through your assumptions you're bringing to it. Pick a paragraph or a page about the supermind, and every time you read it, wait about a week. It'll be like you've read a completely different text. You've never read it before. And even after 20 years, you go back to it and say, I, when I spent that, I mentioned last week, I spent a week up in Northern England reading Nagarjuna and reading Life Divine, and I realized at the end of the week, I had never read Life Divine before in 20 years. I've been filtering it through a, a Buddhist Advaita Vedanta filter, and I had never actually read what he said. So it's a really good thing to keep in mind.
think I, I get lost sometimes in that as well, interpreting it through my understanding of other writers. I also, first I found Wilbur and then that led me to the California Institute of Integral Studies where everybody hates Wilbur and I got attacked by many people just for liking him at all, um, which was very unintegral <laughs> in some ways. Um, but then that brought me to Gebser and to Arbindo, and I feel like I've been interpreting him a lot through Gebser. Um, but then coming back again to what we were talking about with with pain and and the supermind, and um, I just there's this part of me that says we can't like yeah the supermind is at play in all of the painful, horrible experiences, even the ones that seem to make no sense. Because like I was saying earlier, how I've had traumatic experiences, which at the time made no sense. And even part of me wants to look back and say, I wish that never happened. But if it had never happened, I wouldn't be at the place where I am today. But I still don't think that even when I look back at that and I can say, like, see it through the the eyes of the supermind and the bliss, the delight of everything that happened, even the pain. I still don't think that that eliminates like our, like you were saying, um, Marco about ethics, like where does the ethics still come in and how do we, we continue to evolve, um, to be in, in harmony. And, and I think that my partner is reading this with me. He can't be here. Um, doing the discussions with us because he works, um, but he's been reading it with me. And one of the things that he was pointing out was like this whole, well, I don't get it. How is like it okay to like this pain's not like a negative thing anymore? Like where where does that come in? And, um, there was a few lines that stood out to me. Um, he says. Stuff like pain of mind and body is a device of nature, that is to say, a force in her works, meant to subserve a definite transitional end in her upward evolution. Um, and then he says later, pain is pain is in the nature of a nervous and physical recoil from a dangerous or harmful contact. It is a part of what the Upanishad calls Jugupsa, the shrinking of the limited being from that which is not himself and not sympathetic or in harmony with himself. It's impulse of self-defense against others. Um, then he talks about how full liberation can only come from universal standpoint of knowledge, detachment from all things, and yet sympathy with all in our nervous and emotional being. And that speaks to me of like empathy. And um, like, it kind of reminds me of um, Joanna Macy, who was one of the people who attacked me about Wilbur. Um, but what she says about how our, uh, by, by experiencing the fullness of our emotions, whether it's pleasure or pain, um, we actually can empower ourselves to do something about it and transform that and make that evolution happen. Because otherwise, we end up becoming empathetic and just like ignoring it. And I saw that a lot in my environmental studies classes where our teacher would just be like, okay, don't get too depressed. The world's going to hell in a handbasket. See you next week. And it just, it, to me, to be able to sit with the pain and actually feel it, like cry about the environmental destruction that's happening, cry about whatever has occurred that's painful in, on, on a universal level and on the individual and being able to empathize with other people that I think that's also part of experiencing the supermind and, and evolving that into our everyday lives. Um, I don't know if anyone has anything to say about that. But those are my thoughts. We have about five minutes, just another invitation. Just if you feel like it to anyone who hasn't spoken and just be aware of the time.
I want to say one other thing that came up earlier um, as far as like the super mind and ethics and um, we just become in the last few years aware of people who take that idea of the super mind to a level where it's like they can do no wrong. And I think that that goes into honestly sociopathy um, and, and is not in harmony with anything because then there's this like, Oh, well, I didn't hurt you. You hurt you. <laughs> like, cause you're just part of everything and I didn't have anything to do with it because I'm just God and everything's perfect and you have no choice and screw you <laughs> kind of thing. And um, it's, I feel like there's a, a fine line between that when you're experiencing the super mind to not get lost in that. It's like a bad acid trip where you think you're God and <laughs> like, you got to come back down to reality and like it, it, you are, and you aren't in some ways, I guess keeping that balance perhaps. Um, I'm really far behind in the reading, so I'm almost like, oh, do I want to step in? Um, I think I'm maybe just starting chapter 10. <laughs> um, but I, as I was reading, I think, the previous chapter when he was going through sort of um, the forces and he was sort of tying them to the senses, um, I revisited uh, the recent talk that I attended with Sharon Salzberg and Dan Siegel. Um, where he's got this hub, this wheel of consciousness, and he kind of like breaks it up into like the first first five senses, the sixth sense, the seventh sense, the eighth sense. And it, it's so eerily familiar to sort of how um, I feel like where windows were like building up to something, um, but without all the complicated language that, that Orbindo uses. And so um, I really like, as he gets into this description of like, you know, force, this idea of like, oh, this particular type of force, okay, we call that, you know, touch, or this particular type of force in the receptive mode, because um, that's something that you hear in Abraham a lot in Esther Hicks, where she talks about this idea of a receptive mode, but he uses, this as, he uses the idea of receptivity um, in terms of uh, like the sense of sound, so he's talking about their, being receptive to force, and then, okay, that's the sense of sound. And I, I had a lot of fun trying to sort of like sort of take on sort of like, you know, what felt like intuitively aligned in terms of how he was describing those different sort of forces. And I think I think the term force is still kind of vague for me, but um, I had fun with that. And then sort of like you were talking about earlier, Jeffrey, just sort of like making random connections to other things, um, sort of tying that with this uh, wheel of awareness or this hub that Dan Siegel has. and. Um, quite frankly, I couldn't even get through the first few chapters of the reading until like I sat down with Dan and Sharon and all of a sudden I like had enough sort of structure to kind of like plow through the next few chapters um, of where I've been because it actually made more sense to me to like hold it in a way. So um, even though I'm going through it slowly and I'm sort of struggling through um, like sort of attention issues trying to get through the chapters. Um, I'm really actually enjoying it because I find, again, it's like this discipline, just reading a little bit every day, of going into a state of mind that can actually appreciate it. Um, and then when I hear all of y'all talk with all the unique perspectives and different experiences and sort of, um, I feel like sort of biases that we all come to the conversation with, um, it's, it's, it's actually difficult physically to just sort of sit and just experience all of this with you. Um, it's a little uncomfortable <laughs> in, in a nice way. Um, and I think we, I, I experienced this with the uh, Gepser group as well, but I, I have a hard time even making a connection really to this reading and the Gepser reading that I did. Um, so I'm just really enjoying everyone's comments and sort of 
um, my own attempt to try and uh, get something out of what he might be meaning by all of this, but I'm, I'm, I'm enjoying it a lot. So um, that's kind of all I have to share today. So thank you, everyone. And Don, um, really love the, the the piece that you started out with, like just the feeling of what you read. It was so relaxing and so like so like such a relief to just start with that. Um, I don't I don't know exactly what it was that you read, but it was great, and I really enjoyed the feeling of it. Marco, I know we have to go, but on that note, um, I'd like to invite everyone. We had really f- I, I had fun. It was challenging, but it was fun. Uh, the online conversations, which I think last week were almost all male. So I want to invite everyone to uh, join in if you'd like to. I'll try and post, remind me, I'll try and post that and some other things. Thank you. Well, um, would we like... Last chance. Let's just last call. Anyone else who wants to say uh, uh, anything? Um, and uh, if not, I just wanted to plant one seed for future conversation. It may arise next week. It may arise never. Uh, but one of the discussions that Don that I think got picked up, taken a certain distance, but not quite resolved, was the question of stages of consciousness. And um, I want to just highlight, bring attention to Terry's work, who, Ter- Terry, who works with this con- conception of stages of consciousness. And if I'm correct, you also work with lectical assess- assessment? Uh, no? No? Okay. I- I'll take that back then. I think um, that's Derwin. Derwin oh, works okay. with it. So I'm getting things a little bit mixed up. But uh, your point, Terry, about words being like actors uh and um this idea of identifying stages of consciousness like developmental sequence of greater complexity or depth or however that's however you would define that uh how does that relate to supermind is one question i think would be interesting to carry forward and as you ask yourself this question ask yourself as you read each chapter who is developing who and what is developing? Okay. Should we sit for just a moment? Kind of transition. You're going to be late, Marco. You're the one who said you had to go to a meeting. And now you're making me feel guilty. I'm ah, holding you up. You're right, I do. I really should go. <laughs> yes, you should. Uh, all right. Well, thank you all so much for being thank here. Thank you. Thank you, Marco. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Thanks everybody. Bye-bye. Blessings. Yeah.